This episode is sponsored by Frontend Masters. They have a terrific lineup of live courses you can attend either online or in person. They also have a terrific backlog of courses you can watch, including JavaScript The Good Parts, Build Web Applications with Node.js, AngularJS in depth, and Advanced JavaScript. You can go check them out at frontendmasters.com. This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a thousand tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and LA bid on JavaScript developers, providing them with salary and equity up front. The average JavaScript developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary of $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they give you a $2,000 bonus as a thank you for using them. But if you use the JavaScript Jabber link, you'll get a $4,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hired and get a $1,337 bonus if they accept the job. Go sign up at Hired.com slash JavaScript Jabber. This episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is the provider I use to host all of my creations. All the shows are hosted there, along with any other projects I come up with. Their user interface is simple and easy to use, their support is excellent, and their VPSs are backed on solid-state drives and are fast and responsive. Check them out at DigitalOcean.com. If you use the code JavaScriptJabber, you'll get a $10 credit. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 187 of the JavaScript Jabber Show. This week on our panel, we have Amy Knight. Hello. I'm Charles Maxwood from DevChat.tv. A uh, quick shout out about JS Remote Conf. It's going to be in January in the middle of it. So go to jsremoteconf.com to check it out. We also have a special guest this week, and that is Evan Yu. Hello, everyone. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Evan Yu. So I'm the author of Vue.js, and I currently work for Meteor as a core developer. So Vue.js is my personal project, but I also work for Meteor. Do they have, like, I don't know, the action figures, you know, so they have the Vue.js action figure and the Meteor action figure, and pew, 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 pew. <laughs> No? Uh, I wish we had them. <laughs> we do have stickers. Uh, so they're totally okay with you writing a competitor. Well, it's not strictly a competitor, right? So, uh, Oh, Meteor... come on, I'm creating drama here. <laughs> we do have a view layer solution called Blaze inside Meteor, but I started working on Vue.js before I joined Meteor, and I've been just been working on it ever since. But the point is, Meteor it now supports both Angular, React, and Blaze, and uh, there are community packages that allows you to use Vue.js inside Meteor. So... Right. So strictly speaking, there's really no competition there. Right? So Vue.js works with Angular, Ember, and friends? So when I'm saying no competition, it means Vue.js has no competition with Meteor, but it sort of competes with Angular and Ember because they're all front-end frameworks. Uh huh. So Meteor is full stack, which means um, right. So you can use other front-end frameworks inside Meteor if you want to. So what's, yeah. the, what's the difference? Between Meteor and the other frameworks? No, between Vue and, say, Angular or Ember. So I did write a blog post about this. So uh, the gist of it is the most unique thing about Vue is probably its reactivity system, where it sort of takes a very different approach from other major frameworks. So in case people don't know, Angular uses dirty checking. React uses a virtual DOM. So Vue uses... Similar data binding system to Angular, however, it converts all your plain JavaScript objects into reactive ones. So once you set up a Vue.js instance, your plain JavaScript objects become reactive. So you just manipulate them any way you want, and your Vue updates accordingly. So I'm really curious, you know, we have all these other frameworks right now, mm -hmm. and probably a popular reaction you would get from many people is maybe an eye roll. <laughs> but, you know, what motivated you to build this? And taking a look, it really reminds me a lot of Angular 2. So it looks like maybe you've taken like the good parts from what they're doing in Angular 2, the good parts of React, but what really motivated you to work on this? Well, I actually started working on this like almost two years ago. So it's like, it's way earlier than Angular 2. It's just a little bit later than React, and it's like definitely way before React caught on. So some of the uh, original motivation was I was using Angular for some of the projects I was working on. So at that time, I was working at Google Creative Lab, 
So some of my coworkers were using Angular and we were using Angular for some projects. And I just felt Angular was overly opinionated for certain types of projects, right? The interesting thing about front end, the front end world is you have projects of all sort of scale. Uh, you have small, quick, dirty ones. You have huge projects that require a lot of like structure. You have like tens of developers working on. But you have some of those projects like you have only one or two person. You just want to get something out as quickly as possible without having to like go into all the overhead of, you know, uh, a huge full stack framework. So I felt like there is some opportunity there where like Angular provides this great like data binding productivity boost. However, uh, it also gets in the way sometimes for smaller projects and often for beginners as well. Like the learning curve is just not so beginner friendly, I would say. So I started building some sort of a lighter weight alternative. And in that process, I also took a page from some other things. Like the, the main difference between Angular is that it doesn't try to sort of overload you with all these concepts of scopes, controllers, factories, providers, uh, and all that. In Vue.js, everything is just a view instance. So the view instance if you think of it, it's more something like the view model in the MVVM pattern. So I would say in terms of scope, it's really similar to Knockout, both in terms of like a very lean view model based approach and also the reactivity model. But the difference between Vue and Knockout is Vue takes the plain object reactivity route. So it uses the ES5 object defined property method to convert your plain objects into all those properties convert them into reactive getters and setters. So when you manipulate those plain objects, uh, your view just updates. And also, uh, Vue was probably one of the earliest frameworks to just embrace the compo everything is a component sort of architecture. It's very similar to React in that aspect. So every view instance is a component, and you just compose your application as a tree of components. So would you say, because... What I heard you say and what I've heard from some people who have been talking about Vue, would you say that the best use case is for smaller applications, or do you think people should look at it if they have an application now that might need to scale up in the future? So here's the interesting thing. So Vue started out as, out of my frustration with the, the learning curve issue of Angular, so I, I deliberately designed it to be very beginner friendly. Like the API is really, really simple. Like if you just look at the getting started guide, you should, anyone experienced with JavaScript should be able to just pick it up within like one hour or two. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll plus one that too from a beginner's perspective. It was extremely easy to follow. Right. So that's part of the design goal. Like I want to provide the benefits of, you know, data binding and uh, all the reactivity data driven view with a, a, an API that's as simple as possible. But on top of that, it doesn't mean we cannot build complex applications with it because in that aspect, it's sort of similar to React because React Core itself is just a view layer, right? So it's basically you get some state, you render it into a virtual DOM, and that's it. The view React Core doesn't concern itself with how to structure your application, how to you know set up your build tools or all that. It's like community conventions, and it's also... So like why you need Flux to sort of help you structure larger applications. So that's the same case for Vue, right? The, the core library itself doesn't concern with all those sort of higher level decisions. However, if you want to, you can apply those things and combine with the right tools, you can, you can use Vue to build complex large applications. So, uh, so over the time, I've been basically uh, building a lot of like supporting libraries for Vue. So, Vue.js itself, if you just pull it directly from a CDN, you can just drop in onto an existing page and just add some interactivity to the page. But uh, if you go the, the other, basically go the hard way, you start with Webpack, you start with a specific loader. I wrote for Vue called Vue Loader. You will basically get uh, the benefits of being able to write a component in a single file that encapsulates the style, the template, the JavaScript logic, and at the same time, uh, you can still use preprocessors and you get hot reloading and all that. So it's more or less like you get to pick how much you want to adopt the view approach. Like if you are just looking for some light features, you can just use those features. But if you want to build a full SPA, you can opt into the more opinionated way of doing a full SPA if you want to. 
I was actually going to ask something kind of about this, and that is that, so I see in the getting started example and some of these other ones, so you just do new view, and then it has mm-hmm. certain properties to it that you're assigning. One thing that I'm wondering is, is it shows an element that's being assigned. Can you have these overlap elements? So, for example, if I have, like, an entire app, and then inside the app I have something else that I want to add some other functionality to? Right. right. So that's where the component system comes in. So all the getting started guide uh, assumes you are just having a really simple single instance. So the guide is really written assuming a total beginner background. Mm -hmm. Uh, Once you are familiar with the basics, we move on to the component system where where basically everything you've been doing in these basic examples can be sort of encapsulated as reusable components. So once you define and register a component, you can sort of use them in other components just as a custom element. So it works more or less the same way like web components, except you don't need the polyfills. Gotcha. I do like the syntax there where it's kind of all self-contained in one object. The other thing that I'm wondering about is, is there a way to pull in data, say, from some third-party system, some back-end system? Yeah, definitely. So actually, the beauty of this reactivity system is because everything is just plain objects. So it's basically trivial to integrate with any third-party data source. So say you have an API call and you got some, you got back some JSON objects. You just set it on the instance and you're done. So any API that returns plain objects can just be directly shoved into a view instance and it becomes reactive. It's really that simple. So this means you can do just direct HTTP calls, uh, AJAX calls. You can use it with a RESTful uh, resource library. We do have the view resource plugin that's contributed by the community. And if you want to, you can use it with, with, with Firebase. You can use it with uh, Meteor. You, essentially, everything, anything you want to plug into, as long as it gives you plain JavaScript objects, it'll work. So does it sync it back the other way, or are you responsible for that? So in terms of data persistence, you definitely will have to sync it back the other way. So you need to make the calls to the server to do the things back. But the thing is, once you manipulate those data, if you want to persist them back to the server, it's as simple as json.stringify because it works exactly the same way as a plain object. The, the other thing I guess I'm wondering about is with the DOM manipulation, are you doing that with jQuery or are you doing that with something else? DOM manipulation is purely, it's sort of like we implement a similar system to Angular where you bind stuff to directives. So the directive is responsible for mapping any data changes to DOM manipulations. Say, when you have a directive that controls the visibility of an element, you bind that directive to a property on your instance, on your instance data. So whenever that property changes, uh, the DOM will basically be manipulated accordingly to reflect the latest state of your app. Right, but that manipulation, is that all done custom or you... Yeah, that's custom. Okay. We talked a lot about like how much you focused on trying to make this easy for people to jump on board with. One thing, you know, I've done a lot with Angular. I've done a small amount with React. And also in teaching like other juniors Angular, I feel like, you know, it is very easy as a junior to kind of get sucked into the DSL, you know, or some of like the specifics of Angular without really understanding JavaScript itself. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I feel like that is one strength of React. Do you think that view also offers that strength then? Um, That it'll make you, you know, a stronger JavaScript developer because you're having to understand more JavaScript and less of the framework. I would say it's definitely better than the Angular case because Angular tries to sort of force you to think everything in terms of how the framework dictates you to do. So Vue Vue tries to be as unopinionated as possible. So there is one opinionated part where the reactive data in your view instances should just be plain objects. But other than that, yeah, it's mostly plain JavaScript. So a typical VJS app, even at large scale, is composed of all these small components. And if you look at an example app, you will see that every component module is just exporting a plain object. 
So this object contains basically declaratively describe what this component does, like what's its initial data state, what methods can it have, what template does it have. I, I would say there are definitely some some more frameworky parts in Vue than React because React essentially is all JavaScript, but Vue tries to get out of your way as much as possible. So I would definitely say being a better JavaScript developer will make you a better Vue developer. So looking at this, it looks like it provides more... You, you were talking about directives a minute ago. Do you build those directives directly? Can you build your own directives for one? And yeah. do you build those directly into your same when you new up a new view? Or do you attack that a little differently? So you can define the custom directives both either globally or locally. So it's up to you. So you can register a direct custom directive as a global one. So every single instance will have access to it. Or you can, when you declare a new instance or de define a component, you can sort of limit a custom directive to that specific component. So it's only available to that component. So you've been working on Vue for a while. Who else is using it? Quite a lot of people, actually. So currently, I know quite a few companies just built their startups, actually built their products on it. So I've got um, users in Japan, in Russia. It's pretty interesting uh, how the adoption sort of is quite organic and the Laravel community is currently pretty psyched about Vue because uh, the author of Laravel is uh, using Vue for his projects and Laracast has been doing a series on Vue.js. So in terms of companies, there was larger scale usage. For example, Optimizely have been using Vue since the point ten days. That was like really, really early. And... Grammarly has been using Vue.js too. I do have a very incomplete list on GitHub where people sort of just contribute what they're doing with Vue. So it's called Awesome Vue. I guess I could see some people maybe being a little bit nervous about using Vue um, for a couple of things like, you know, it, with it still being somewhat new, but then also when you're looking at something like Angular or React, you have like a lot of people working on the framework. So is this something that you are able to set aside more time for? Or are you going to have help working on it? What would be some things you could say that would convince people that they should go forward and that it'll be around for a while? Right. So uh, I actually get asked that question a lot, like say, like there are frameworks that get sponsored, they have full-time teams working behind it, but a lot of times uh, I would rather look at the numbers. So if you go to the Vue.js repo on GitHub, you will see that the number of issues that's currently open is under 20. And I did see that. That's awesome. <laughs> right. Or I think when I looked the other day, it might have been 11. <laughs> right. So basically, um, most of the bugs are fixed within one day or two. And the consistency of how issues are responded to, I think, is more meaningful than how many people are actually working on it, right? So because you, when you look at a page, just look at how many open and reproducible bugs that's currently open. So for Vue, like there have been more than 1,400 issues and the currently open issues is under 20. And there's basically... Uh, I would say there's currently maybe one or two reproducible bugs that's not closed at the moment. And when I wrote the 1.0 release blog, there was literally zero reproducible bugs. And most issues are closed within, closed within a day. I have been basically maintaining 100% test coverage on every single commit since the 0.11 rewrite. So that's, I think, more than a year ago. And I guess it's more or less up to... How users would value like what they get out of it. Like for people who prefer sort of like this sense of like knowing that something is sponsored or something has a full time person working on it versus knowing like looking at the track record, seeing that things are being consistently attended to, seeing this project is being actively maintained, seeing that bugs are getting closed. I think it's really up to how you would interpret these, right? So even with a full-time team, you will still see projects that has like tons of bugs that's not closed, that's not being actively, actively attended to. So so where are you hoping to wind up on uh, Vue.js? Have you kind of arrived there with version one or do you have plans for it in the future? So that's actually a question I myself am 
I'm not really sure about it because um, if you started it out as something really small, it's like an experiment. Uh, it accidentally got interest from some early users, so I decided to work on it a bit more. So back then when I released it, it was more or less just an experiment to see if it's possible to do a fully reactive system using the ES5 getters and setters. Turns out it worked, and turns out there are actually people using it, and that's why I still kept working on it all this time. And there are times that I basically just put it aside and thinking just not really paying much attention to it, but after a while, there are always some events that someone discovers Vue, makes some wave about it, and for example, this latest event was a Laravel community discovering Vue and they sort of get very excited about it. So this type of events kind of kept me voted, motivated on working on this. And it's seeing that people are being like the users being really grateful about something that you worked on is probably the most important factor. In terms of how the future goes, I think like I kind of want to make make Vue one of the um, legit choices when you are starting a new project because I believe like as I said the front end projects like you have all sorts of needs right you have different team environments you have different stylistic preferences you have different project requirements it's unlikely that there's one framework that will just fit all the use cases and I believe there has the room for something that is super easy to get started with, but also doesn't doesn't limit you to simple applications. And I think Vue basically serves that special role in that it's easy for you to get into, but can basically stay along with you even when you are building large and complex applications. So the follow-up question here is, what is it not good at? Like if somebody came to you and said, I want to build something, you would say, oh, no, don't do that. Right. So the one thing is probably the biggest difference with React in this sense is React has React Native. So that's an area that Vue has basically no intention to getting to. Mm -hmm. And the Angular team probably has ambition in that area too, because all these frameworks, they're trying to turn themselves into paradigms. They are trying to, you know, dominate all the UI development on all clients. And that's what I see the React team is trying to do. They're trying to turn React into this sort of dominant paradigm for developing all UIs for all clients. And Vue is not trying to do that. It's trying to provide you with this very pragmatic solution for the web. If you are familiar with JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, then you can pick up Vue and get productive in a day. So that's the goal. That's about enabling people to do things quick and fast. It's not about reinventing something that's totally revolutionary and just overthrow everything that's in existence. What about testing? How does it stack up when you're testing it? So the easy answer is because every Vue.js component is eventually compiled down to a common JS module, so anything that can test a common JS module can be used to test a Vue component. And because of Vue's, basically the way Vue is designed, we try to make it very, very... Your, your Vue model will end up really, really dry, and it's almost entirely about manipulating some plain objects. So... That makes it super easy to test. For example, uh, when you have a component that handles a user action, you don't really have any sort of DOM manipulation in your JavaScript code. It's all about like pushing an object into an array or just setting a property. So these things are super easy to test and assert. So Vue doesn't really provide any sort of like tooling or infrastructure for you to do that, but anyone experienced with basic JavaScript unit testing should be able to just do that. Cool. So I, I have a question. This is Dave, by the way. Sorry I'm late. Just Hello. happy to be here. <laughs> nice to meet you, Evan. <laughs> nice to meet you. So I went through the Vue tutorial, which was very yep. interesting. And one of the things that occurred to me as I was going through is I could take an Angular app and uh -huh. do a search and replace for replace ng with v and pretty much have a Vue app. Is, was that uh, on purpose or did those two designs kind of emerge separately? So Vue is definitely inspired by Angular. So in, in the parts you missed, we talked earlier about how Vue was born out of the, the frustration of, of the learning curve issue and all the extra concepts that I deem unnecessary for front-end development. So definitely the data binding parts is a direct heritage from Angular. It's, it's largely inspired by Angular, and uh, you will see that a lot of terms are actually the same with Angular 1, like directives and filters. So the concept is largely the same. 
uh, the biggest difference lies in the in the reactivity model and how opinionated the framework is. So in Angular, the reactivity model is done through dirty checking, right? So for every directive, you will have a watcher that sort of is bound to an expression. And the way Angular updates your UI is it needs a signal to basically trigger the system to enter the digest cycle. So it just basically loops through all the watchers on the page, reevaluate every single expression. And if the value of the expression changed, it will update the DOM accordingly. So this model works, but the issue is that uh, a lot of people talk about Angular and they say, I would run into performance problems because I have too many watchers. So that's the issue because when you have too many watchers, any single small change on the page would actually trigger all the watchers in its current scope and its all child, uh, child scopes to reevaluate. And it's really hard to sort of limit how many watchers this digest cycle like affects because um, if you really need the reactivity, you can't really cut them. Like you can sometimes yeah. use like one-time bindings or things like that. But if you just do have so many things on the page, like you basically have an app that's really hard to optimize. So the difference with Vue is we have a real dependency tracking based reactivity system and it's all hidden under this plain JavaScript syntax. So we convert your data objects properties into getters and setters using the object defined property method. And after we do that, oh, we, interesting. Right. So after we do that, we basically get a purely dependency tracking based system that's really similar to knockouts. So Knockout uses this a very similar reactivity model, but in Knockout, every getters, every getter and setter is explicitly a function, right? You have to create a, a Knockout observable object, a wrapper function that wraps your value. But in Vue, you don't have to do that. So this gives you much better interoperability in terms of data APIs, but also gives you a like purely dependency-based reactivity system. So when you change, okay, when you have really a Vue cool, app, by the way. Thanks. So let's say when you have a view app with a lot of bindings on the page and you change one single data field, so only the one single binding that's affected by the change would get notified and all the other bindings on the page have nothing to do with that change, then they would just do nothing. So, so from a performance perspective, this makes view apps really simple to optimize because mm -hmm. really there's like nothing you need to do. Like how much data you change means how much part of your app will be re-rendered. It's just all proportional. That's super cool. So it's almost like the best of both worlds. You get these nice template declarative HTML, but you get the speed of React like tree diffing all in one, right? Right. So it, it probably is different from React in that sense. Like it, I would even say it's... So when we, I actually do a lot of comparison with React too. So in virtual DOM diffin, it if you think about it, it's more or less dirty checking on the view. Yeah, layer, yeah, basically, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, say you have a huge React app and you change a single field and you set state on a like very high level component. Mm -hmm. That means that that component and all, all its ch child components, the whole sub component tree needs to be re rendered and diffed again. Not re-rendered, uh, but, well, yeah, like regenerated I mean, the virtual DOM, right? Right, like a virtual DOM re-render, and then you need yeah. to go th go through the diff, right? So the, the idiomatic way to, to sort of improve that is you have to implement should component update or right. use immutable data structures. But right. both of these would, like, introduce a lot of, like, extra work. It's just, like, something you don't even need to worry about when you're using Vue because... Even if you change a, a data field on a very high level component, it doesn't really affect anything in its subcomponent tree if those components are not interested in that piece of data. Okay, that's really clever. And so the trade off there is that you can't support IE8, right? Yes. Another trade off is so Vijuk's, uh Christopher of the React team, so he gave a talk uh, earlier about uh, the uh, optimization of animations in React. And uh, that's actually a talk where it sort of uh, highlights this sort of performance difference in terms of changing a very small piece of state in a huge application. Because uh, in React, if you do that like at 60 frames per second, you would actually run into performance issues. Even if like the DOM, virtual DOM re-render is fast, it, you would still it's still not fast enough if you're doing it 60 times per second. But the trade-off for a data binding system is we would have to set up all these reactivity system, right? We have to convert these properties. We have to set up the watchers, the bindings, and all those. So 
this is all, a lot of actual work at startup time. And it does uh, impose a bit more memory usage, constant memory usage. So it's a trade-off, but most of the time, the difference is not that significant at the boot up time. And also, uh, when you are using a React app, if you're gen- regenerating huge virtual DOM trees on every re-render, then it's also a lot of uh, memory usage and GC oh, yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah, my experience is actually with React with gigantic virtual DOM trees. It's actually much slower than an equally sized set of dirty checked scopes. Mm-hmm. In other words, the tree diff algorithm is pretty intense comparatively, for at least for some of the tests I've done. But you're saying with Vue, you bypass all of that with the trade-off being that you have to do some initialization up front to make sure you're, you got your defined, what is it called, uh, defined property right. stuff all set up on all your data objects. Exactly. Very interesting. So are there any edge cases where a developer could inadvertently change their data model uh, without Vue knowing? Yes. So there are some limitations of uh, of, J- of JavaScript, the language, right? So one of the issue is assuming an ECMAScript 5 environment, we cannot detect addition and deletion of properties. So it's possible with object observe, but it's being Canceled. removed from the spec, <laughs> unfortunately. So yeah, so the limitation... When you add a property, if you will not be able to pick it up. However, it actually sort of enforces the developer to, to sort of the recommended approach when you're declaring data in Vue is sort of like how you would declare uh, get initial state in a React component. Mm-hmm. You would have to declare all the properties you want to be reactive upfront, and it sort of becomes a schema of your uh, component instance. So this is actually very good practice because from the maintenance perspective, when you look at a component later, you instantly see what properties on this component could potentially be reactive. And if you add properties on the fly, it becomes really hard to track down when you edit that property. So it ends up sort of helping enforcing this sort of best practice. And if you just declare all your properties up front, you would actually never run into that problem. Um, so I see that you've got some documentation about how to package up Vue apps using Webpack. Would it be okay mm-hmm. to talk about that for a minute? Yeah. So if you go to the site, you will see that uh, with Webpack, and I have a uh, Webpack loader called Vue Loader. So what this Vue Loader enables you to do is to write a Vue component as a uh, in a single file uh, that encapsulates the template, the styling, and the JavaScript logic all in the same file. And it's actually, it actually looks very similar to how you would write a web component. Like you have an HTML page that has the style, the template, and the JavaScript logic. It, it feels really similar to web components. However, the good part about going this non-standard way is that we actually get to leverage the full power of Webpack for each part of our component. Right. Say you have a style section in your component and you don't want to use plain CSS. You can actually use whatever preprocessor you want. All you need to do is declare its language uh, in a view component and you can use less SAS or post CSS, whatever you want. So, so the view loader will extract CSS, pipe it through another loader and reassemble everything together back into a common jobs, uh, common JS module and your, your app will just work. And it supports hot reloading using Webpack's hot module replacement API. So say when you edit the style, you edit the template, it just reloads without reloading your page. Oh, very cool. So I, I noticed one of the things as I was going through the guide was that Vue will warn you if you use a what looks like a custom tag in your markup, but it's not a registered component with Vue, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which I found really cool. But one of the things that I found template systems like Angular 1, Angular 2, and Vue seem to suffer from is that I can't follow a dependency tree easily. For example, like a require JS dependency tree that you know Webpack can normally follow. How does it know exactly which templates need to be included in a bundle when you do that? Or does it? But does it bundle them together at all? It does bundle them together. So I'm not sure what you mean by not being able to follow the dependency tree because. Um, when you use a view component, you basically use the standard module module interface. You can require another component. If you use ES 2015, you just import, export. It's all like yeah. J- JavaScript modules. Well, but in the template itself... Um, oh, I see. You know, I've got, I can use components, but I don't declare that I'm using them anywhere, right? You do. 
So in Vue, when you register any type of assets, say a component or a custom directive or a transition effect, these are all considered assets. So you can either register them globally using a global view method, but that's only for quick and dirty small projects. So in large projects, you will have to sort of pass them into a specific component as its private assets. So if you look at the example, like when you declare a component, you can have an option called components, and that's where you basically declare what other components should be available to this component. Cool, I see now. Right. So you. So that's like Angular two style, right? Yeah. Except uh, Vue doesn't really force you to use dependency injection. Right. Right. Cool. So what kind of benchmarking have you done to, to compare performance of Vue to other frameworks, or have you? Uh, yes. So um, it's actually. Pretty interesting because uh, in the early days of Vue, um, there was this um, to do MVC benchmark floating around that was originally written by someone at Apple working on WebKit. So it was on GitHub. It wasn't really like published anywhere. I just happened to stumble to it and I just, it was testing the same to do MVC application using most of the mainstream frameworks. I think it got popularized even more later by the author of OM. Uh, David Nolan, he had a post on uh, how he how he built ARM um, on top of React and had better performance in that benchmark. So I was really curious. So I ran the benchmark, and turns out Vue is really fast. Like it's the fastest uh, of them all. And for some reason, it, it was actually because the benchmark itself was more or less flawed because uh, it was synchronously adding, toggling, and deleting a hundred items one by one. And Vue leverages asynchronous updates. So say when you are manipulating the same array, you're pushing an item in a loop, right? You push 100 items. Vue actually only performs one update because whenever you trigger some data change in an event loop, Vue won't instantly update the DOM. Vue will buffer all these data changes until the next tick uh, before actually performing any DOM updates. So this avoids doing unnecessary work when you are, say, mutating the same array a uh, hundred times in the same event loop, because there's just no point in doing that. And because of that specific benchmark, Vue just is significantly faster in that benchmark. So I, I posted it all on the original Vue website, and it basically got a bit controversial because um, other <laughs> frameworks... how you authors, feel. <laughs> right. So uh, the Ember guys was actually pretty pretty angry. The... Um, uh, Stefan, like, I'm definitely not trying to badmouth anyone. Like, it was just an interesting, uh, ink, like, a conversation where Stefan was, uh, looking at my, uh, benchmark and was saying, this is not idiomatic Ember code. If you want to, like, get the real number, you should do this and that. I was like, okay, but, uh, why don't I have to do that in view to get these numbers? So we basically went back and forth. And in the end, we more or less agree that the benchmark itself wasn't a perfect like reflection of real world performance. So I eventually took it down. But interesting enough, uh, later on, Elm actually used that benchmark <laughs> to showcase its performance. That benchmark even got included in a talk uh, by the author of Closure in one of his talks. So whenever I see that benchmark referenced elsewhere, I always kind of feel like a bit guilty because I, uh, I sort of contributed to like this thing. It's it like, I want to explain that this benchmark is not like a perfect, like a uh, basically all micro benchmarks are somewhat misleading. Of course, um, yeah. And so another benchmark I did was uh, one of the JS repaint perf. Like when Ember team re announced their uh, 2.0 rewrite of the Glimmer engine, mm -hmm. so they released this thing called DB Monster, where uh, it's like re-rendering a page. Yeah, the, of a, the, like a, from Ryan Florence's talk, right? Right. Page. So. So that sort of uh, sparked a lot of people just like doing the same benchmark using their own frameworks. So Vue has that too. In case you're interested, there is a project called JS Repaint Perfs on GitHub. You can search about that. And yeah, Vue is doing pretty well. Actually, Vue renders the thing faster than React. And that's, that's for the case when we are replacing the whole data with brand new data. So like we have an array of like 500 items. Actually... Uh, 100 items with ne more nested items, right? So uh, uh, every single re-render, Vue has to reconvert all those objects to become reactive, and Vue is still showing faster numbers than React. And Vue actually prefers mutation than like full replacement. So if you optimize even further, 
and just like do in place mutation instead of full replacement views number just goes off the roof. It's like 80 frames per second or something. So yeah, again, these are benchmarks. So I want to sort of emphasize like every benchmark is more or less only testing one specific situation. So I sort of came to the conclusion that when you're evaluating the performance of a front end framework, you sort of have to consider all different scenarios, right? There's the initial render performance, there's the uh, hot update, but only changing a small part of your state. And there's the sort of full full replacement, like you're just like completely shoving a new like state tree into your app. So these are all three very different scenarios. So Vue is relatively slower at the startup, like when comparing to React. However, it's significantly more efficient for small updates and it's comparatively performant uh, when you are doing full state replacement. Super interesting. Yeah. All right, then before we get to the picks, I just want to acknowledge our silver sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Thinkful.com. Thinkful.com is the largest community of students and mentors. They offer one-on-one mentoring, live workshops, and expert career advice. If you're looking to build a career in front-end, back-end, or full-stack development, then go check them out at Thinkful.com. This episode is sponsored by TrackJS. Let's face it, errors cost you money. You lose customers, server resources, and time to them. Wouldn't it be nice if someone told you how and when they happen so you could fix them before they cost you big time? You may have this on your back-end application code, but what about your front-end JavaScript? It's time to check out TrackJS. It tracks errors and usage and helps you find bugs before your customers even report them. Go check them out at trackjs.com slash jsjabber. Dave, do you want to start us off with picks? Oh, let us see here. You caught me by surprise. I didn't know we did picks. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! Okay. Yeah, yeah. so I have one pick for you today. This is in the entertainment genre. This is a, a Netflix original series that I'm sure is old news. And I will say that if you don't enjoy a little bit graphic violence, you probably won't enjoy this show either. But the show is Daredevil, and it's continuing in the now very popular theme of superhero uh, TV shows and movies, And I, which I just, I don't know why, but I love them. I think it's probably because I used to try to fly as a kid and uh, never never could. So anyway, Daredevil on Netflix. I enjoyed it, even though I had to close my eyes, literally close my eyes for some of the scenes because they were so graphic. But other than that, I really enjoyed the story and the characters were super cool. So that's all I have for you today. All right, Amy, what are your picks? Okay, Dave, I'm happy to know that you also did that because I was obsessed with Michael Jordan and I also thought that I could fly like his movie. <laughs> I used to just also sing the song, I Believe I Can Fly. I believe I can fly. <laughs> Anyways, but also speaking of entertainment, I also have an entertainment pick, but it's different sort of out entertainment. I feel like this may have been picked uh, way, way, way before I ever listened because I may have heard this on Ruby Rogues at some point a long, long time ago, but I have not heard it picked on JS Java since I've been listening, but it is uh, this YouTube channel and they have all these different sorting algorithms that are done by Hungarian dancers. Oh, oh I and love that. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so it is absolutely awesome. It's entertaining and it's also educational. You uh, have to watch it on fast forward though, because it's so long. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess it would depend on which algorithm you're watching. <laughs> Whether That's a good point. <laughs> for it. But, I mean, I, I say that it's entertaining, but it's also, like, if you're a visual person like I am, it's actually very beneficial to see. So that is my pick for this week. All right. I've got some picks that are a little bit more... I've just been playing with this and I've been really enjoying it. I'm actually inviting uh, the devchat.tv community to join this particular pick. And uh, what it is, is it is, uh, it's called relativefinder.org. And it uses the free online database at familysearch.org to do its lookups. And if you're in the same group as other people, you can find out how you're, you're related to them. So for example, I joined a group that had my my mother-in-law in it and found out that my wife and I are 13th cousins once removed, but it also tells you who like famous people you're related to. Um, it has authors and poets, uh, Catholic saints and popes, uh, constitution signers, declaration signers, that that's uh, U S uh, European royalty, famous Americans, famous Europeans, etc., etc. So, you know, in here, just name a few. I'm related to Henry David Thoreau. Robert Frost, Samuel Clemens, who is Mark Twain. I have a 10th great grandmother listed here in the Salem Witch Trials who turned out to have been executed uh, as a witch. (laughs) 
I have five people from the Mayflower, including my 12th great-grandfather. I'm related to Barack Obama. We're 13th cousins once removed. Um, and a whole bunch of other presidents, uh, JFK, George Washington. Anyway, it's been really fun to just kind of look and see how I'm connected to people that I've heard of or people that I know because there's a group in here with my neighbors in it. You know, so I'm related to Richard Nixon and Millard Fillmore. And anyway, it, it's been really, really fun. So if you want to sign up and get in, you have to have an account on familysearch.org that is free. Um, and then you can go over to relativefinder.org and just sign in and it does an OAuth thing or something to get you in. Oh, I'm also related to Walt Disney, 10th cousin, three times removed. So, I mean, it's just really kind of cool to see who I'm related to. Elvis Presley, Charles Lindbergh. Anyway, I'll stop, but I'm really, really enjoying it. If you get in and you want to see if you're related to me or related to other people in the community, I created a group called DevChat and the password is DevChat. The group name is all uppercase and the password is all lowercase. But by all means, hop in and then shoot me a tweet or an email or something and tell me how we're related because I think that'd be way fun. Evan, what are your picks? First pick is uh, is a leather good brand called Hardcraft. You know, if anyone's heard of it, it's a UK brand. It just uh, makes really good leather goods. I got them for birthday and it's just so good. And the other one is a uh, interactive piece called Piano Chase. It's made by Alexander Chen, who is my uh, former boss at Google. And he just does all these crazy music visualizations using web technologies. It's super cool. And uh, you guys should check it out at uh, his website, which I'm posting here. Amazing music visualizations. That sounds like fun. All right. Well... People want to know more about Vue.js or about what's going on with you, Evan. What do they do? Yes, follow Vue.js on Twitter, uh, join the Gitter chat room, or f- throw the question on the Vue.js forum. It's all on the website. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap up the show. And we'll catch you all next week. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Do you wish you could be part of the discussion on JavaScript Jabber? Do you have a burning question for one of our guests? Now you can join the action at our membership forum. You can sign up at javascriptjabber.com slash jabber, and there you can join discussions with the regular panelists and our guests. 